So I'd like to call the meeting to order, please, uh, 4.30. And um, we'll do a roll call. And since I can see all of your faces, rather than calling your names and having you wave or whatever, I'm just going to run through the list if that's OK with everybody. Um, I see Dale, Bryden, Thomas, myself, Rhea, Callie, Kim, Joanne, Eric, Jared, and Megan. So um, with that said, I don't think we have any public to be heard tonight. Um, so we'll just jump right to the approval of the um, minutes from last month. I hope everybody had a chance to look at that. Um, is there a motion to approve those minutes? Bryden, is there a second? Tom, okay. So we have Bryden and Tom. All in favor of approving the minutes, um, please raise your hands, hand. Okay, so all of the members um, vote to approve. Are, are there any um, uh, against? No, so that passes um, unanimously. Okay, moving right on to accessions then. Eric, if you would. All right, I will share my screen. So you should see the May 2021 proposed accessions to the Longmont Museum collection. The first item up is a double stroller. Um, this was originally purchased uh, in Biloxi, Mississippi in 1955. The family did move to Longmont in 1959. Um, and the stroller was probably used for their, their youngest child born in 1961. Um, but one of the reasons why we did take it is because uh, it really does document a, a part of women's domestic life, 20th century childcare, and, and these are areas that we're certainly wanting to continue to develop and document. Mm -hmm. Any questions on uh, that accession? I love the name, <laughs> Old Arola. <laughs> Yes, it is a cool piece and in good condition. All right, next up is actually one you have seen before as a, do you think we should take this? Um, a city bottling works bottle, Longmont, Colorado with uh, the stopper. Uh, we discussed this in March uh, because we had similar ones, but without the stopper and uh, at that time, the board uh, felt it was appropriate to collect this one since it was more complete. And so we have now actually received it into our possession and so we can officially bring it to the board for uh, a vote. Next up is a little bit larger donation. Um, and this comes from Longmont's Public Safety Department. Um, public safety does always request a um, condition. Normally we don't accept conditional donations, but because it is another city department, um, we've, we've made an exception in past uh, donations from public safety. And it is a condition that if the museum ever deaccessions any part of the collection, it must be offered back to the department, specifically the leadership of the department for their decision before we can uh, move to any other disposition. Um, the actual uh, donation, uh, there's a number of digital photos from the flood of 2013. Um, and then some hard copy photos, uh, one of pumpkin pie days, I don't know exactly how they ended up with it and one of a police car at, I believe it's Fifth and Baker Street um, in probably the 1950s, as well as a um, newspaper 
that interestingly enough is about an air raid siren that is in our collection. So it seemed appropriate. Some evidence and non-evidence tags and emergency preparedness plan. And it's hard to see this little silver thing here is actually a uh, measuring tape that was used at crime scenes. Uh, so kind of an interesting, uh, you know, if this object could talk type, type of thing. Any questions on that donation? Seeing none, we will move on to the first of what will be a number of these. Um, this is the only one for this month, but um, as part of the Longmont 150 exhibit, we are collecting glasses from all of the active local breweries, distilleries, and cideries in Longmont. Um, so this one is from a very small uh, and only very infrequently open a uh, brewery in Prospect called Primitive Beer. Uh, they use wild yeast to create their beer. And so they've donated this Bordeaux glass that they use for their beer. Um, any questions on this or the sort of whole concept of uh, accessioning all of these uh, glasses from local breweries? How did you decide on doing glasses, Eric, as opposed to cans or something else? Um, part of it was we wanted something that we knew was clean and didn't have, you know, residue in it. So um, that was that was one thought. And then um, it's just a little more unusual. I think you know a lot of people collect cans and bottles. But um, doing the glasses. And then History Colorado did a similar display of all of the pint glasses from, from breweries throughout Colorado. So we thought that was kind of a fun thing to, to play off. Any, uh, anything you can share about how they're going to uh, uh, be shown in the exhibit? Um, basically, there'll be I believe in one the plan is to have them all in one case, I think sort of on a tiered uh, display system. Cool. All right, nothing else. Um, last item is one that when we sent it out was pending delivery, it did arrive. Um, so. Uh, Monday, May 17th, um, steam engine, the uh, uh, bundle wagon, and these uh, butter making tools all arrived at the museum. Um, it's a little hard to see sizes on these. The, the steam engine is about three feet tall, three feet wide. Uh, the wagon is about uh, two feet long. And um, this uh, box is about um, 18 inches square. Um, and the nice thing about, about these, which again uh, are something that we did discuss at a previous one is, uh, previous uh, advisory board, is that they all do have very strong local connections. They were made in hygiene, used in hygiene. And so um, we're actually planning on if the board approves it, uh, displaying the steam engine and the wagon in Longmont 150 as well. So, any questions on that accession or uh, any of the... Oh, I have one quick, quick, one okay. quick question um, that may not matter, but um, you have, you said cideries, you just, did you say you were including distilleries as well? Uh, yes. Yes, the plan is to include all of the alcohol producers in Longmont, assuming they make glasses. If not, we'll use some other piece of collateral that they have. Okay, thanks. If nobody has any other questions, then is there a motion to, um, to accept all of these proposed sessions? I make a motion to accept all of the proposed accessions. Thank you, Rhea. Is there a second? Uh, 
Bryden, Bryden thank you. I'll second. Uh, all in favor of uh, accepting of these proposed accessions, please raise your hand. Okay, that is all of the voting members. Opposed, anyone opposed? No, so that is a unanimous approval of the proposed accessions that have been presented today. Thank you. And uh, Kim, would you like to give your report? Sure, as soon as I can find my mute button. Can you all hear me okay? Okay, um, so I did, we've got a lot of things going on in tonight's meeting. So I thought maybe I would just um, uh, go over a few items on this report if I can get my computer to work for me. Um, and then of course, chime in with questions if, if there's anything on the report that you wanna know more about. Um, we are working with Ascenza Architects. We talked about this last time we met that um, they're, they're working with us to do the master development plan. And we actually uh, uh, launched a community feedback um, event last Saturday. And then there's going to be another um, members event that happens on June the 3rd from five to seven. And of course you are all invited to this if you're interested in seeing the, the boards in, in, um, in person. Um, we also are gonna be launching these on our engaged, engaged Longmont website soon. We're just getting um, some edits done for that process to happen, but it should be, but I would think by the end of the week, we should have it up on Engage Longmont. Um, and we can go over, I can look at the, we can share them tonight, but I don't wanna spend that much time on them since there's gonna be some other opportunities for you guys to take a look at them. Um, but basically what has happened and what I, I wanna make sure you all know about is that in this process, um, Harold Dominguez, the city manager, instructed us to include the 500 seat performing arts space that was part of the phase two of the uh, feasibility study. So Tom, if you recall from your question last time, um, and I, I wasn't at liberty to say last time, but now I am, that, um, that essentially we've been asked to look at the phase two part of that feasibility study to see if there's any chance. I mean, we don't even know for sure if it's possible given parking restrictions and, and uh, code and that sort of thing. But the city manager really just wanted us to be able to take a look at it while we were in the process of doing our master planning anyway. So to take advantage of this moment when we're working through um, these, these planning um, processes with an architect to just see if there's any way we might be able to accommodate that 500 seat facility. So we don't really know the outcome of possibilities yet. I do think that one of the things that we have landed on is that the only way we will be able to accommodate a 500 seat facility at our site is if we do a parking garage. Um, which sort of adds a whole other level of expense to the project. So we're we're kind of working through all of that right now. Um, so we'll see. There, the event that we had um, last Saturday was actually, there was a lot of very, very positive response to the idea of including a performing art space. So we'll see, you know, kind of how that plays out um, with our additional uh, uh, community feedback. And of course, we want your feedback as well. And I want you guys to be honest about it, you know, like just tell us what you think. Um, and I'll share those drawings with you guys soon too. Um, we're also working on another part of our um, our strategic plan, which is the interpretive plan. And I think that that process is, is moving forward really nicely with Beth Kaminsky. Um, and big thing for us, uh, given the last year plus that we've been going through, is that we're going to be moving back to our normal hours June the 1st. And so that's Monday to Saturday, 9 to 5, and then Sunday, 1 to 5. And um, we had actually chosen that date long ago based on when we were starting our summer camp activity, um, but it ended up jiving nicely with the new mask orders and um, moving to clear 
um, in the with the Boulder County Public Health Order. So we're still waiting on final um, determinations of mask wearing in public spaces, um, but in private spaces, we're actually able to go unmasked at this point in time. And so um, I have a feeling these things are gonna start moving pretty quickly that, that we'll see uh, less and less restrictions around this. And I included um, the language from the public health order if you were interested in seeing that as well. So, so we are opening back up slowly but surely. Um, we don't have any pending events scheduled for the auditorium, which is kind of the big thing that we deal with when it comes to these different um, uh, capacity limitations and mask wearing and all of that because it's a 250 seat facility. But um, we will be dealing with that when it comes to the fall. So even when it comes to our rentals, um, that's that's kind of what we're looking at is, is fall is gonna be the big time where we start making some decisions. Um, we're gonna introduce Megan here in a minute. So that shows up next on the report that she started on May the 10th. Um, and we are unbelievably excited to have her with us. So we'll introduce her and have you all introduce yourselves to her in just, just a minute. Um, you may have seen that our seasonal newsletter is back in print. Hopefully you all got yours in the mailbox. I know that we've gotten some feedback already that people are excited to see that back in their mailboxes again. So that's exciting. Um, during this time of the impressionism exhibition, we sold 38 memberships and uh, e either sold or renewed 38 memberships. And then we've also sold or renewed um, for giving club memberships. So that's great. We're starting to see some uptick in our, see some decline, of course. You might expect we saw some decline with that. During the school district, the um, Innovation Center Elementary STEM program that we're working on, and then also um, with their mobile lab. And so those are some things that, again, we've been working on for some time, but they sort of took a back seat um, during the pandemic and we're trying to get those moving again. Um, so those, those are underway. My computer is being very slow, so I apologize as I move to page two. Um, we do have great uh, sales in our summer camps. Um, in the report, it says 26 of 30 have minimum capacity, but in fact, I think it's even more than that now. The only ones that we've had trouble selling are the ones that are virtual. So clearly nobody wants to do virtual programming anymore. So that's actually, I think, a very good sign as well. So we're doing really, really great. And I think we'd set some limits based on our um, uh, being very conservative about um, the number of, you know, like socially distancing and that sort of thing. But I think, in fact, given some of these new orders um, and distancing mandate, we probably will open those up to even more people. So that's going to be great for our revenue, just FYI. Um, we've also awarded all of our camp scholarships. So that's really good as well. Um, making sure that we reach some people who otherwise wouldn't be able to afford it. We're always glad to do that, to expand that more in the future with Ben's help, of course. And then um, one of the things also in our strategic plan is some inclusivity work. And so Anne um, in our education department has started an internal idea uh, group that um, we, we have come to prefer this um, acronym of IDEA to, for our inclusivity, diversity, equality, and accessibility work. Um, you might see this in a lot of different ways. A lot of people say DEI, or you might see IDA, or you might, it comes up in a lot of different ways. And the, and the one that we have come to really embrace is IDEA. You know, it's got a lot of other connotations, so we like it. Um, and so we really are trying to figure out how we can embrace this better at the museum and um, go from beyond just welcoming people, but also creating a space where people feel like this is where they belong. And so we've started that um, in a lot of ways already. You know, we've done um, Spanish translation in our rotating exhibitions. Um, and of course, the work that Anne does with um, some of the outreach. But 
we, we got some things that we could do in addition to all of that. So we're going to keep moving that forward. Um, and then maybe in the same vein, um, in the virtual tours that we're doing, um, Eileen's been working on one that it centers on women of Longmont. And so that should be working um, sh shortly. I don't know, Eric, if you've got any updates on that, but I think that that's just about ready. Um, and then I'll move uh, just a little bit further on that, you know, we've been getting loads of um, loans and donations coming in for the Longmont 150 exhibit. So um, again, Eric's been really um, pounding the pavement to try to get some representative collection to, to, to tell a really great story in that Longmont 150 exhibition. Um, and then he's also started an internal data and evaluation group that's part of our strategic plan. So I think that this is all really great timing, especially with Megan starting with us, because a lot of the work that she's going to be doing is going to really center on trying to understand, um, you know, donor data and revenue data and evaluation data, all of those things for grants. So um, this is this feels like it's all coming together rather nicely. And then we also included a bullet point here about the questions that we've been getting pretty frequently lately around the KKK. I don't know if you might have seen that the that History Longmont recently published, if you will, they made um, public the journals that they had in their collections that document members of the KKK. And it's that and the, you know, the political climate that we're living through at this time have really prompted a lot of people asking questions about the history of KKK in Colorado, the history of KKK in Longmont. And so we've actually received a lot of questions about it. And Eric's had to rewrite some things. Um, and I think that as, you know, to try to be responsible at the same time as not kind of, um, I, I'm not exactly sure how to, how to characterize this, but we just, we wanna be the most responsible historical institution that we can be when it comes to these questions. And so um, we've committed to acknowledging that Longmont Co you know, um, was controlled by the Klan for years in the 1920s, and that we um, don't take a position on whether a uh, local historical figure was a member of the KKK, unless at that time they publicly aligned themselves with the Klan. There, there actually is a lot of, I mean, this is tricky history, you guys. I don't, I, again, don't know if how aware you might be about this, but essentially, you know, in the twenties, there were, it was a social group. Like this basically showed up in yearbooks as like a social part, you know, like everybody got together and they were part of the social KKK, blah, blah, blah. So it's really difficult to untangle members of the KKK that were doing nefarious things from people who joined because they thought it was a good social thing to do. So it's kind of a tricky line to walk and we are trying to be responsible historians when it comes to this. And so um, we're trying not to be, uh, we're, not trying, we're not hiding this history at all, but at the same time, we wanna be responsible caretakers of it. And it's coming up over and over again. And so I, I just wanted you all to be aware of that. Uh, I'll let Jared talk about Longmont 150, the next section of the um, report. Uh, we had a very funny um, staff meeting the other day where I was like, what are you up to? What are you up to? And everybody answered, Longmont 150, Longmont 150, Longmont 150. So that's kind of what he's working on is Longmont 150. Um, and then moving on. Uh, onto our the, um, the auditorium programming and special events. Um, I'll let you guys read through this. I know that a lot of you paid pretty close attention to the different programs that we do. And so they're listed there. And then Justin includes a kind of snapshot, which includes the winter and spring. We had 50 programs, 66 uh, program participants, 12 partner organizations and collaborations, 
and 1,800 views. Um, that's through our website, Facebook, Longmont Public Media, and the Comcast channel. So we're getting tons of views through those different outlets, which is, is pretty amazing. And then we've got a couple of different um, entries here for our rentals, which um, since we wrote this report have actually ticked up even more. We're starting to get a lot of inquiries about rentals at the museum and, and that might be expected that, um, you know, as people are starting to kind of re-enter, they're also looking at, at events and things like that. Um, there is one kind of pending thing in terms of how we navigate this, which is we don't quite understand what eating and drinking looks like at the museum um, as, as it relates to our rentals. So we're working with the city attorney's office to try to navigate that and, and have a, a, a strong um, kind of solid policy about it as we re-enter, if you will. So that's good news actually, because that means more revenue for us as well. And then we've got um, the visitor services entry there. Um, you can see that we've got 100 and 841 visitors in April. And then our free day on April the 10th, we had 111 visitors and then about $2,700 in sales at the gift shop. So all of those are, are great numbers in terms of kind of ramping back up to what might be normal. We did do um, a, a program that we hadn't done previously, and it's it's um, turning out to be quite successful. Which the which is that essentially in that first block of time, you know, we're doing time tickets right now, and so in that first block of time, we've reserved those for assisted living groups and reached out to them to try to um, see if anyone was interested. And so we've we've been able to get some groups in during that first time period. And I think it's being extremely successful. So I think that we it, this is one of those things that we will probably um, take forward even after the pandemic passes that we can um, kind of learn some of these lessons going forward. Um, and then we've got some some new people coming on in order to ramp up for um, more people in the building and more events going on in um, our our facilities. Um, in terms of the work that Angela is doing with AIPP, they have um, been working through a task force uh, to try to select the executive committee, um, and so working through um, nominations for that. Um, and then also working on the, I'm trying to read through this quickly. So we have um, uh, the, just like with the museum advisory board, the Art and Public Places Commission has some open positions. And so um, if you know anybody who might be interested in either the advisory board or Art and Public Places, then please let us know all about that because the, we all need those positions filled. Um, so, and we find that the grassroots efforts are often more um, effective than some of the other postings that we can do. So let us know if you know any of your friends that might be interested in joining these boards. And then Angela also did um, a, a presentation at the Front Range Community College Latino Excellence Achievement and Development Series, which is um, the acronym is LEADS. And these are a group of uh, students that um, represent folks from the Latino community. And I think that they are, I mean, the work that they do there is amazing. Uh, to try to build these sort of leadership skills in um, these students in the Latino community. And I think they're a great resource for trying to be able to sort of pipeline professionals. And so um, I'm, I'm very excited that she was able to make that connection. And we, we hope to be able to um, partner with them um, even further into the future. So that was sort of quick. Is anybody got any questions for me? Okay, I am available if you do find any questions. Um, so let's see, I'm trying, uh, what's next on our agenda, Eve? Um, did you wanna introduce Megan? That's why I was asking. I would love to introduce Megan at this time. So what I would love to have us do, if you guys don't mind, is um, everybody can turn on their microphones and you can introduce yourselves. But first, let me let you guys know that Megan Peter started with us on the 10th. 
She is our fund development manager, which um, is the city's terminology for basically, you know, uh, raising money. Um, and we adore her already. And we're so excited to have her on our staff and to be able to help us really put a lot of energy in um, some private uh, fundraising. Um, so Megan, tell us a little bit about yourself and then we'll have everybody else introduce themselves to you. Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, like Kim said, my name is Megan Peters and I'm so excited to be here with you all. Thank you for having me and letting me come to this meeting. Um, let's see about me. I have been in fundraising um, for a little over 10 years now, which is hard to believe, but um, I most recently was working in child welfare. Um, but before that, I had a lot of experience back East with an arts and cultural organization the Greater Hartford Arts Council, where we served as an umbrella organization that helped fund and support a lot of different um, arts and culturals in our community. And so I'm thrilled to be back. Um, it's my first time working for a museum and a city, so it's a lot to learn, but it's been really wonderful. And I'm just really excited to see where this all goes. Thank you so much. Um, Eve, do you want to tick people off or you want me to tick people off to introduce you guys? Doesn't matter. All right. Well, what, will you introduce yourself first? Okay. I'm Eve Lacey and I'm the chairman of this board. I do a lot of volunteer work at the museum, um, including the memberships. And I don't know, that's about all there is to know, I guess. <laughs> it's so nice to see you. I was in a meeting with Joan yesterday and she was singing your praises. So I'm very excited to to see you. Great. Well, thanks. If I can help you, let me know. I will. Same. She's, she's being very humble. Eve is our volunteer who puts in the most hours every year for like ever. So yeah, she's fantastic. We adore her. Callie, it's your turn. You're up. Hi, I'm Callie Cordova. Um, yeah, and I am the newest board member. Dale. Nice to meet you. I'm Megan. Welcome. I'm Dale Bernard, and um, I'm just finishing my first term and applying for my second. <laughs> so, which has to be done by May, by the end of this month, May 28th, I think. Yep, 28th. <laughs> um, and um, we're all so pleased to have you. Thank you. So nice to see you. Tom? Well, I'm Tom Kurtz. I believe I joined this group in, uh, last summer, maybe August. Um, haven't met any of you directly, <laughs> but maybe someday. But we welcome you, Megan. I'm a retired hospital CEO of about 45 years. Wow. In, in total. Yeah. Wow. Nice. Rhea? I started when I was one. <laughs> I figured. I, I just assumed that, yeah. <laughs> Rhea, you're up. Hi, Megan. Welcome. Um, I am Rhea Moriarty. I am not sure exactly when I joined the board. I, I took over someone's um, term who had left. So I joined sort of off of the, the regular schedule and I'm now in my first actual my term um so <laughs> maybe maybe two years anyway um it's it's been a joy to be on the board so um welcome I'm sure thank you, you. so me. nice to meet you Rhea tell us where you work uh I work for the Longmont Humane Society so, oh yeah. yeah I'm the director of operations over there so um nonprofit is very nice. My yeah. thing, kind of. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm very, very familiar with the need to fundraise. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. That's great. Bryden. Hi, um, I'm Bryden Cook. I've been on the board since 2016. Uh, and I guess I'm the vice chair, too. Um, I'm a writer at a technology company in town. And uh, I just love the museum. <laughs> Very nice to meet you. 
Susie, are you yeah. there? Do you mind introducing yourself? There she is. Yeah, here I am. <laughs> I'm joining from my phone today. Um, so I am council member Susie Hidalgo Faring, and I'm serving at um, the board as the board council liaison. Um, and I'm also still in my classrooms. <laughs> so I'm a third. I'm also a third grade bilingual teacher. And oh my ADHD. goodness. So, so you've got a ton of free time, sounds like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Nothing but free time. <laughs> yeah. So nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Welcome. Thank you. And I have somebody on my screen that just says community services. I'm not sure who that is. Uh, Angela? I think it's Angela. <laughs> are you Are you also? I Then I have two. Facilitate. Oh, no, no, no. Never mind. Never mind. Never mind. It went away when you turned your camera on. Okay, sorry. Okay, that's all of us. So does anybody have any questions for Megan? If not, all right, great. Okay, where are we next, Steve? Okay, so now it says you're going to talk about the unaudited statement. Okay, Go let ahead. me really quickly... Yeah. Is there a spot? I'm sorry, I don't have the agenda open. Is there a spot uh, to talk about the master development plan or? It's down in the new, bus new business, but you, I okay. mean, you can get to it then if you want. Nope, nope, nope. I, I, will, go, I will go to financials. I'm going to try to share my screen. Let's see if this works. Tom, you had asked about this at our last meeting. So I thought it might be worthwhile to um, just, I, I don't want to spend a ton of time on this, but um, if anybody has any questions about it, of course, just let me know. But I think sure. it's to I think it's totally uh, uh, appropriate for you guys to understand um, the way our budget works a little bit better. And it's a bit, it's a, it is a bit of an education. Education. So if, again, if you have any questions, just let me know. Can you guys see the screen there that has the financials on it? Mm -hmm. No? Yep. You can. Okay, great. Okay. So one of the first things I want to make sure you understand is that this is our um, 2020 year in financials, but it, they're unaudited. So this is a draft, but in fact, um, it's probably pretty close. Um, the things that tend to change um, before they finally get audited are very minor. So um, I, I would call this pretty darn close to, to final and the audit should happen. The audit should be happening really quickly. So um, these are going to, these are going to be pretty close to the final numbers, but just so you know, these are unaudited figures. Um, and I wanted to bring this part of the report up um, just to make it clear to you that, you know, we've got, essentially four different funds that the museum operates. But um, in the general fund, those dollars are essentially use it or lose it, if you will. We don't maintain any of that year over year. And so at the end of the year, that is zeroed out. But that's not true for our AIPP fund, our museum services fund and the museum trust fund. And at this point, we are at about um, two million dollars in the bank, if you will, and that the majority of that money really does come from the AIPP fund. And so, the way that that fund is populated is through capital projects that are over fifty thousand dollars, and one percent of those projects hit that AIPP fund. Um, and so during the, you know, after the flood happened and there was a lot of capital improvements that happened on the heels of the flood, this ba balance really um, in increased a lot. And so um, we're still kind of seeing that. And Angela's working really hard to try to spend this money so that, I mean, there's no reason to keep its fund balance as high as it is. Um, we should be paying artists is what we should be doing, you know? Um, and so she, she really is working hard to try to um, pick at that uh, fund balance, but we, we are sitting nicely. I mean, I don't want to take these down to zero. I want 
these, I want to have a little bit of cushion because anytime we might go over budget, this is where we would rely on, on a little bit of cushion. So I like having a little bit um, of buffer in Actually, the you know the the way that the city is funded is through taxes, um, and we generally speaking get about a million dollars of uh, subsidy through the general fund every year. And what you see here is what we receive at the museum as revenues. So what you're seeing here is that basically this figure, the total of our expenses equals this figure, which is the total of our revenues, always, that's always true. And so the amount of money that we were get that we get from our revenues is offset by the amount of money that we receive as a subsidy from the city. Um, and then there's, you know, always these sort of miscellaneous dollars that that show up as well. So basically, you know, our revenues that go back to the city, um, plus the, the, the subsidy that we receive from the city is our total revenues in the general fund. AIPP, as I talked about, um, essentially is funded through these capital projects. And so generally, and Angela, you're here, so you can um, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we usually see about $200,000 in revenue every year. Like I said, that there was an exception um, after the flood and there were a lot of capital projects. But I think generally speaking, this is the, the sort of revenue that we expect to receive every year. I think if Angela disagreed with me, she would tell me. So then, the right. okay, thanks. Um, and then uh, museum services is, um, that's where we really see um, the grants hit that fund, um, the charges for services, those are the uh, educational programs. So our summer camps and art and sips and that sort of thing, those dollars hit this, this fund. Um, and then we see our private grants, our private fundraising hit this fund. And then the kind of wonky thing, this one right here, when we um, were ramping up to be able to get SCFD tier two qualification, we actually passed a number of resolutions through city council in order to be able to have mm -hmm. our budget reflect things that were museum related that otherwise didn't actually hit our budget. So for instance, building maintenance and parks uh, mowing and things like that, that, that are legitimately museum expenses, but actually showed up on uh, in different accounts in the city. And so when we were ramping up to try to get SCFD tier two funding, that was one of the things that happened is that there was a resolution, several resolutions actually that happened so that we could just essentially have a, a transfer in to, rep, to, to reflect those dollars, but then essentially an immediate transfer out. And I kind of think of it as like, we paid our bill, right? So we paid our bill for facility uh, facility maintenance, we paid our bill for mowing the lawn, we paid, you know, and so what you see is that this dollar figure, in essence, is um, countered by this dollar figure. Um, there's a little, there's a little bit of a, of a difference, but essentially, they are a transfer in and then a transfer out. Um, but what it does for us is that those actual expenses hit our budget so that we are able to achieve that SCFD tier two threshold. So those are the things that end up in that museum services fund. The museum trust fund is um, a funny thing because it's a it's kind of a relic from the olden days. Um, and we've reserved it essentially as the fund where we do all of our transactions for the gift shop. And so um, we do it's it's that one is easy that one is basically gift shop expenses hit the expense category and gift shop gift shop revenues hit that budget um so that one is actually a really easy one to track so 
with all of that said, our uh, total revenues for 2020 are about um, 2 million bucks. Um, and we, for just, just this is kind of as an aside um, with this little educational tutorial, um, but the threshold for SEFD tier two revenue is about 1.7, $1.8 million. So what we would do and this is kind of a white a wash, but but basically what we do is we take that figure and we subtract the amount of money that we got from SCFD, like that they don't they don't count their own revenue when determining uh, that threshold. So essentially, this is F SCFD money. It's a little bit different, but mostly this is S SCFD money, and so it would be this figure, the two million dollar figure, minus this figure that. Um, would tell us what our revenue threshold is for SEFD purposes. So that's a quick and dirty tutorial about our, our um, financials. I am happy to take questions if anybody has any. I know that that's probably a lot. And if you um, wanna dig into this and ask me questions later, that's fine too. Okie doke. I don't think there's any questions. So Eve, if you want to take us on. Okay. Um, I do not have a report. So um, Jared, would you mind giving us your presentation? And then I don't know if you also want to address the, the things that you're doing that were in um, the director's report, all the stuff you're doing for exhibits as well. Uh, sure. Thanks for inviting me. I'm going to start talking a little bit about my background, talk about what our exhibition process is, and then talk about some of the upcoming exhibitions we're going to have coming up. So I'm originally from Western New York, the Rochester area. I've been in Colorado about 25 years. Um, I've been working museums for over 30 years now, and I've done, been involved with like 50 or more exhibitions. I was a studio art major in college with a concentration in printmaking and luckily got a job right out of school with a strong museum in Rochester, New York. They were originally a museum on Victorian history, but while I was there, they switched over to more family friendly audiences and it's been incredibly successful for them. They've added onto their building two times and now they're in the middle of a third edition. So it was kind of interesting to watch that transition take place. Uh, moved to Colorado in 96, got a job with the Denver Museum of Nature and Science in their exhibition department, doing design work and some exhibition development. Worked there about five years, took some time off. Motorcycled through India, Southeast Asia, came back to America and found a job at the Walmart Museum. My original plan was only to be there about a year, go to grad school. And 16 years later, here I am. Uh, my role has definitely evolved over the years. Um, I'm currently curator exhibitions, a role in which I wear many hats. Um, I oversee all the gallery work and work with the exhibition team on what exhibitions we want to pursue. You know, I do exhibition development, design, fabrication, installation, deinstallation. Um, we've curated shows from scratch. We work with guest curators. Um, we also do rental exhibitions. It pretty much runs the gamut. Uh, one thing I really like about the Walmart Museum is that we're small enough that we can kind of decide what we want to pursue. And it's also really a creative environment and a lot of really great people are passionate, passionate about their work. So our process, we have about 2,500 square feet of temporary exhibition space and about 2,500 square feet for Front Range Rising. And we do a mixture of in-house developed exhibitions such as the Lowrider exhibit, Longmont 150 coming up, World War I was in-house developed, um, TP to Tiny House, which was supposed to open last summer, but it's gonna open next summer. We do rental exhibitions. So there's lots of companies out there that have rentals we can bring in-house. Like examples of that would be Ansel Adams, the dinosaur exhibition, tree houses. Red Grooms wasn't really a rental, but we did borrow it from another art museum. Um, if we do do rentals, we like to make it relevant to Longmont. So we'll 
sometimes add things locally, like the dinosaur exhibit, we borrowed bones from DMNS, you know, Denver Museum of Nature and Science, or taxidermy animals for the treehouse exhibition. Red grooms, we borrowed rodeo items from the Pro Rodeo Hall of Fame. And then we also do guest curated shows such as the Impressionism exhibition that's on there right now. But believe it or not, we can usually do the in-house exhibitions cheaper than most of the rentals. And one of the advantages of doing it in-house is we can customize it to represent our community. And what we'll do is we'll reach out to members of our community who have, have an expertise in the subject we are presenting and form a committee to help develop the content of the exhibition. And we also get to do the fabrication in-house, which is kind of a rarity in the museum world these days. We're really lucky to be able to do that and have the facilities to be able to do that. Um, we've also started a paid internship program um, so we're working with students interested in exhibition design and fabrication, mostly from CU, their environmental design program. And I've been doing this for 30 years, and I just kind of want to pass some of my knowledge on the next generation. So it's nice to do that. And so far, it's been pretty successful. We've had some really good interns. So we do have an exhibition team that meets twice a month where we discuss exhibition development. We'll brainstorm what exhibitions we want to pursue, um, get all these ideas together, and then we'll do a visitor survey and just see what the visitors think, just because we might have blind spots on what we think might be popular or what's not popular. So it's great to have the visitors chime in. And we're actually in that process right now of getting the visitors input on what we want to do next. Right now, we are booked through 2023, so we're looking for exhibitions for 2024. And once we do that, we have an exhibition development process, which I'm gonna share with you guys. Which I believe it's this one. So essentially we'll develop the initial exhibition concept. We have a program evaluation tool, which was something that came out of our last strat ops. Um, I'll show you that real quick. So did that change to a new screen or are you guys still seeing the original screen? It new changed. Screen? Okay. So we call this PAT our program. Uh, what does PAT stand for? Something program assessment tool. So it's 10 different criteria and then it's a matrix. So we see, you know, what does excellent look like? What does adequate look like? What does poor look like? And then we do a score based on that. And then we add it up in just, it's a way we can compare exhibitions against each other through all these criteria. And we found it really helpful just to have conversations around the exhibition and how it's gonna impact different parts of the museum like education or programming on the facility. So this has been really helpful, just mostly for just having the conversations, getting everyone on the same page of what this is gonna look like. So after we do that, um, we'll run some front end evaluation with visitors, get gauge their interest. Um, we've also done evaluation with what titles people like, things like that. We'll put it in the schedule, form a project team, determine who the project leader is, contact any community stakeholders, content specialists, define roles, responsibility, who's gonna do what. Um, we'll have meetings, brainstorm the content we wanna have in the exhibition, develop a budget, um, talk about potential funders we might use, and then it's researching all of the content, uh, determining loans, permissions, conservation requirements, learning goals, um, programming plan, develop a marketing plan, how we want to spend our marketing dollars, um, design approach, we'll do a quick bubble diagram. So what's going to go where, how things relate to each other, uh, the exhibition look and feel, colors, fonts, do we want old, do we want modern, you know, what, what are we trying to get across in that regard. Um, develop the budget more, what's everything going to cost, fundraising plan, um, are we going to need staff in the gallery, determine what's going to be done in-house, what's going to be done out of house, shipping costs, all of that. Then we'll do an outline, which is everything that's in the exhibition, all the objects, photos, um, text, um, determine loan paperwork, any contracts we might, 
might need. Then we go into design. We'll develop the interactives. Um, what's going to go where? Create a 3D floor plan. We use a program called SketchUp to do that. ADA accessibility review um, and a plan life for components. So if we build stuff, we want to know like, can this be used elsewhere in the community so we just don't have to throw it away after it's been on our exhibit. Uh, we build prototypes, um, get these in front of visitors, see if they're using um, using the interactives the way we thought they would. Um, get any translation done. We are doing our exhibitions in dual language now, English and Spanish. Then it goes on to production of the exhibit, mounts, labels, graphics, um, you know, what's going to go in the case, where it's going to go, and then it goes into install and then deinstall. So that's kind of it in a quick nutshell. Does anyone have any questions on any of that so far? All right, next I'm going to show you guys what we're going to work on or what we've got coming up in the future. Um, next, we have Longmont 150. So I'm gonna share the floor plan on that. So Eric's the lead curator on this. Um, it's divided into five categories. So this first section will be technology, or no, it's natural disasters, sorry about that. This section is technology. This section talks about beer and water and the relationship. A lot of breweries located here because of the quality of Longmont's water. This section is on transportation and this section is on equity. So SketchUp's a really great program. It allows us to lay everything out 3D, um, it's two scale, so I can take measurements off that, determine what's gonna go where. This is a cool civil defense siren in our collection. Um, this is a little interactive we're doing on the train crossing at Main Street. So it'll be all these little cars and an actual electric train going back and forth across Main. And then you can write a comment on your experience with getting stuck on Main Street by the train. After that, we have an exhibition called Washi. Let me show you that one. And Washi is, it's based on Japanese paper. And it's nine, so this is a rental exhibition. It's nine Japanese artists. And it's a really traditional method of making Japanese paper. But these are contemporary artists that are actually using it to make sculptural things. A lot of it is 3D, some of it is two-dimensional. But I don't know if any of you guys saw the Above the Fold exhibition. It's the same company that we rented that from, and it's actually the same curator that worked on that, put this show together. So a lot of really nice varied stuff. So we're re really excited to have this in the gallery. And this one will open on um, January of next year and will run till May. But just like this is incredible, just it looks like lace work. So that's Washi. Next after that is the TP to Tiny House exhibition. So that one we were supposed to install it last summer. So we have this one about 80% built. Um, this is a family from the exhibition. We want it super hands-on. So this is going to be a shepherd's wagon. They used these in the late 1800s, early 1900s for sheep herders. So they would pull it to a pasture in the mountain. Um, the sheep would graze. And then once they're finished grazing in that area, they could move it to another spot and the sheep herder would actually live in it. So it's gonna be full, Full size, you're gonna actually be able to go into it, kind of see you know, what their life was like. This section talks about log cabins. Um, these are some actually historic logs that were from one of the early log cabins in Longmont. This would be tools related to that, to building a log cabin. This is actually a log cabin made out of pool noodles. So kids will actually be able to build a log cabin and tear it apart. 
Um, this will be a pillow fort building area that's kind of geared towards younger kids. Um, this is actually a full size tiny house that this is actually already built. There's a 53 foot trailer in the back museum parking lot. I don't know if you guys have noticed that, but that's actually where all this stuff lives right now. So we built it so it could come apart, go into a trailer and store it. So we'll be able to pull that out, put it back together. Hopefully I'll be able to remember how to put it back together because it's it'll be two years since we built it. Um, this part talks about Native Americans and um, living in a teepee and how they were designed to the premise of the show is building a house is a conversation between humans and the environment. So you're building based on the environment you're trying to protect yourself against. This section will be on alternative building methods such as like straw bale construction or earth bag, um, rammed earth. And we're also working with CU's architectural program to kind of brainstorm ideas of kind of up and coming types of construction methods. Um, this is a wind tunnel interactive, which we have built a prototype for that. So we have components where you build a house, you put it in the wind tunnel, expose it to varying degrees of wind and see which designs hold up the best. So as I said before, we had this about 80% built, but there's still a lot of work to do. Um, after that, we're talking about doing a contemporary Native American art show. So for that one, we wanna bring in a guest curator. So right now we're brainstorming Native American curators and artists that we know that we could work with. And what we kind of wanna do is bring people of color in as guest curators to kind of give them access to curating in a museum and just curating shows and just kind of share the power so we're not putting you know, a Western lens on what we're showing in the gallery. So that's gonna happen in um, spring 2023. And then in summer 2024, we're doing an exhibition in collaboration with the Boulder Museum of Contemporary Art, where we're gonna pair artists with farmers. Um, and it's gonna kind of focus on the land and the relationship to the land and try to get across what the visitor's relationship with the land is. So they're gonna partner with the farmers over a period of time and we're gonna display the artwork that comes out of that relationship. We're also going to have artwork on three off, they're offsite like farms in the area. So between here and Boulder, Olman Farms is one of the farms we're thinking about working with. So we'll have artwork actually on the farms and we're talking about possibly having a couple weekends where we activate the farms and have performers and other artists and everything come out to uh, have more things going on. So that's kind of a quick, what we do. Does anyone have any questions or need clarification on anything? That's great. Thanks so much, Jared. Yeah. It's always interesting. I don't know how you keep, and then of course you're the king of making those, uh, whatever they call sneeze guards for everywhere in the city. Yeah, we got transferred to that once COVID hit is utilizing our CNC machine to make plexiglass barriers for all the public desks throughout the city. And we ended up doing 75 to 80 of them. Everyone custom just, sheets and sheets of plexiglass but it was good it was good actually to you know get back to work and feel useful after being stuck at home for so long Does anybody have questions it's not thank you yeah I'll, yeah I'll just add that i think jared is a total rock star like he can design anything. He is so good at working with students and being a mentor. He is such an incredible asset to the museum. So I, I sing his praises often. And it is a team effort. We do have a really great exhibition team, which is nice just to get input from educators. You know, Eric's a really great historian in his perspective. Eileen, the registrar, 
Um, Joan is part of that. So we have marketing included just, just so we can cover all these different bases and look at things from many different perspectives. And it really helps also to have community members as part of the team too, just because we're a small staff, so we're not experts on everything. And there's so many passionate people out there in the community that know so much about so many different things. So just to tap into that, and it also builds excitement within the community when you do that. You know, instead of just being top down saying these are what you should learn, it's good to go out in the community and rely on their expertise and just see what they want and what they think is important. And we try to do visitor evaluation. It's something we can do a lot better in exhibitions, but hopefully we'll be able to get a position that can focus on that on a more consistent basis. But we do try to put it into our process. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Jared. The only thing I wish is that you had shown us pictures of the shop. Well, if you guys are ever in the building and want to tour the shop, please let me know. I, I love showing it off. A lot of people don't realize it even exists, but it's a really, for a small museum, we have a really nice facility. We're really lucky. In a very small space. Yeah. We do run into storage issues quite a bit. That's why you see containers on the parking lot. That's overflow. Cool, thank you. Okay, so now um, the next thing on the list is some old business. Um, the land acknowledgement statement update um, looks like um, what I understand anyways, that we're looking for approval of, of the draft as a starting point um, for it then to be forwarded on to whether it's city council or other entities here in the city for uh, additional um, consideration and updating. And I don't know, um, council member Hidalgo Faring, did you want to speak to it at all? I think Eric has a copy of the current draft that maybe he could put up for us. I wasn't sure. Okay. No, and I think when we met with Carmen, um, something we had discussed was, you know, the idea of having something that is short. Um, and I can't, and Kim, correct me if I'm wrong, wasn't there going to be a space, I, I think, on the website or something where we could, um, where we would be able to have like a longer, more um, historical context? Or maybe, I don't know, maybe, that was something I had in my notes. Yeah, we had talked about that because I think that um, based on some of the inclusivity work that um, Carmen has been doing, um, <laughs> you know, there are, there are these sort of expanded statements, but, but functionally it would uh -huh. make sense to have something short, um, especially yes. if we're hoping that that city council will adopt it and, and um, recite it with frequency. Okay. Yes. Um, yeah. And I think for us, and this would be something that I would really heavily emphasize with um, our city council and members of our staff is we have to also put this into practice. Otherwise it's just words. So it, we have to kind of make that commitment. So I think when we had that resolution for uh, the climate, cl the climate emergency, so taking concrete steps to address the climate emergency. So if we are going to move forward with having the uh, land acknowledgement, a statement recognizing um, the historical, um, you know, the, the land that we reside on right now, um, what um, what have been what's what were the traditions of this of this land before we arrived? Then we need to also show that in our practice. So you know, I want to make that commitment so as well. Right. So I'll also share um, the list that Carmen shared with me. Um, that I think goes to that point um, that that ultimately there is action behind this, um, and uh, a lot of uh, been a couple of projects that um, 
Angela's been working on where we think that this is going to come into play, that there are going to be collaborations with the Northern Arapaho. So Art and Public Places is working on some relevant projects. Um, the Longmont Sister City is forming an official Sister Cities relationship with the Northern Arapaho, and that is the first in the country, you guys. This has kind of been in the works for a while now. Um, and I don't know that people really understand the significance of it because it really will be the very first time that this kind of relationship has been established with a, a sovereign um, Native American nation. And so um, I don't want that to go unnoticed. And um, we also, the uh, Carmen is also working on an intergovernmental collaboration with Boulder County, City of Boulder, and the City of Longmont to develop a co-management of open space for indigenous use. So th that's things like a sweat lodge. Um, we're talking about doing a sweat lodge at the Sandstone Ranch um, space. And so they are also working on additional uh, uh, space for traditional use at Sandstone Ranch. Um, and then, you know, there are things like uh, the quilt that is at the Civic Center that um, Jared actually helped uh, mount and install. And, um, you know, one of the other many things that he ends up doing. Um, but I do think that trying to understand the, the bigger picture and then also what could be coming in the, um, I would like to encourage us all to consider um, adopting this as a draft so that um, Susie can feel comfortable moving this on to city council, uh, the other city council members. Does anybody have comments? Does anybody have any questions about it? Oh, sorry, go ahead. I guess not. So um, if no one has other comments or questions, then I guess I'd like to put it out there. If, um, is there a motion to make this land acknowledgement statement that we have here um, something that the um, Longmont um, Advisory Board, Museum Advisory Board um, would like to approve as a draft for further review and use um, in the city. So if there's somebody who would like to make a motion to do that, Tom, Let's see Tom, is there a second? I'll second. Sorry, is that you Callie? Okay, thank you. All in favor, please say aye, I can't see you. Um, so aye. see you all. Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, so that is a unanimous support of this particular draft. So thank you very much. Thanks for putting that up, Eric. So we'll look forward to hearing back what happens in the next steps or um, the next uh, reviews of that and, and where we're where we're gonna go from that, that point. Um, as far as new business, um, Kim, that's where we had the master development plan schematics information. If you wanna to talk to that. Sure. Hang on one second, I'm trying to share with you guys. Can you see that? Okay. So these are the boards that are actually at the museum right now. And as we've said, there's gonna be another um, a member uh, uh, event on um, June the 3rd from five to seven. So you could see these in person if you wanna take a closer look at them. Um, so I'm not gonna go over these in um, detail. I just wanted to kind of introduce them to you and make sure you guys were aware of these opportunities to provide some more feedback. Um, basically what the architects have done for us is that they've broken them down in terms of a site plan with an accompanying floor plan. And so um, on the outside, you get a sense of kind of how it would occupy our portion of Quail campus. 
And then on the inside, you get a sense of, of what those different details look like. Um, so this is what they are calling um, concept A. So concept A um, ends up having all of this parking around. It's got this sort of courtyard area in front of the museum. So that, that space that's our current roundabout, that would go away. This is actually a new roundabout that's part of the Quail Campus Master Plan. And then there are these kind of um, connection points into the Quail Campus Park, if you will. Um, so this is a, this would all end up being um, uh, hardscape here, hardscape here in our courtyard with um, a, a more sort of purposeful uh, courtyard in the back. And then once we get into the floor plan, what you see is that our um, uh, loading essentially changes. So in this plan, what you see is that the, the kind of beige parts of this, that's the existing building. And currently what we have is that the load in um, is here, which is problematic from a number of, of vantage points. One being that we've got our back of house basically in the front of the house, but also it's really difficult for trucks to get in there. Like just technically speaking, that's difficult. So that would change to this portion of the museum. Um, and in this version, they have added that 500 seat facility. So that's what you see here. Um, so we've got some loading, we've got a new gallery here, a new gallery here, some new uh, restrooms here, some new restrooms here. We've got some, uh, this turns into a bit of a cafe and then out onto the plaza, we'll be able to spill and have some sort of social space. Um, we, we are dedicating some of this to the specific spaces. Um, I wouldn't pay that much attention to because all of this is movable at this point, but currently we've got this as the children's dedicated museum. Um, and the entry then ends up being here. One of the things that we're trying to address is um, the, you, I'm sure that you guys have experienced this, the ice that is in front of the museum because of our Northern orientation. Um, and so that would end up making this basically the entry point. I'm gonna move on to the next one. Um, this is the site plan for concept B. And that is um, without the performing arts uh, addition. Um, and so the entry ends up being here, which would give us even more of that sort of Western exposure and help us address the ice issue. Um, and then the courtyard um, sort of expands out here, the, that, that um, uh, Northern courtyard expands out here with these, again, these connections to the interior of Quail Campus. Um, and then we've got the same kind of thing happening with, which is that we've got hardscape here um, and we've expanded what we're doing in the courtyard um, back here. And then on the site plan, what we're seeing, oops, sorry, it's touchy, um, is basically we've got a, a kind of similar arrangement with new gallery space here, new gallery space here, new um, loading here. Then we've got a cafe here, um, and new gift shop in all of these, we've got a expanded gift shop as well. And so the entrance is here with basically this sort of corridor to reach all of these other spaces. And then in plan C, this is another kind of um, example where there is a, the addition of the new um, auditorium space, except in this, what they've done is, oops, uh, let's see there. Um, is that the auditorium is on the sort of northern side. And the thing that happens with this one is that basically we create this nice courtyard that connects this performance space with this performance space. And so I think there's a lot of alignment there. And again, we've got the additional gallery spaces, we've got the um, reoriented loading space. And um, in this example, what they've done is they've got a co covered parking there. I'm, I'm sorry, covered entryway there. So that's what you see here. In all of these, they have been very mindful of loading in. So some like bus drop off places and that sort of thing. Um, also in all of these examples, 
there is, it's under part in, in virtually every example. So the thing that we are considering if we do this is that we may need to do a parking structure. And what has ended up making a lot of sense is that the parking structure would go here so that we can share that with the rec center. So I don't wanna go into too much more detail. Again, I'm happy to answer questions that anybody might have, but you will definitely have opportunity to look closer at these things and, um, and kind of dig into the details of it. In all of them, the architects have included sort of benefits and trade-offs to consider. Um, and so you can kind of look at those in a little bit more detail. Um, and so let me know if you have any questions. I'm, I'm happy to address them. And we're, we're continuing, this is a moving, like all of this is evolving. So none of the drawings that you see here, um, should we consider final designs at all? This is all, you know, trying to receive some information, trying to understand what the community really wants to see happen at this site, trying to understand how we might be able to um, fit it all in, in that location. Um, so I am open to any questions if you guys have any on the on the top of your heads now. Okay, hey, we'll hey, be sure to let you know. Go ahead, Eve. Sorry, I just have one question, and I'm I'm sure this is totally out of line, and and maybe not something that you even have at this point. But do we have any ideas costs on you know we have not, three versions, and then there's the parking structure, and I mean, do we have you know any no ballpark at this point even? Not at this point. So basically what the architects are hoping to have happen is that we will get all of this feedback. And then of course they're getting a lot of feedback from staff as well. And so we'll get all of this feedback and they're, they're hoping to be able to, um, to narrow this down to a single design. And as I said, these are high level conceptual designs. So it's not like it's a, a finished product but at least um, uh, narrowing this down to a single design. And then once we get to a single de design, that's when their cost est estimator is gonna come in and really give this a thorough comb. And so we'll understand what the parking garage would cost. We'll understand what a, an additional 500 seat facility would cost. Um, and so we hope to have the answer to that question by about mid June. Oh, that seems fast. Yeah. Since it's past mid-May. Yeah. No, they're fast. We've been doing this. Um, uh, I, I, I Now I can't even remember. It seems like maybe mid-January. And they, they are sticking to a schedule very well. And so I feel confident that they'll be able to get that for us. Okay. And I know that we really probably don't want to go here, but the, the extra 500-seat auditorium that potentially is part of the other project. Does that just mean that we have more stakeholders involved in decisions on this if yeah. we go that way? Yeah, yeah, definitely. If we go that way, they will very understandably want and need to be involved with the design decisions. Um, it wouldn't make any sense for us to build that and for them not to be able to use it. So we definitely want to make sure that their um, voices are heard in that process. And so, yeah, you're right. They, we will, we will make sure that their um, preferences are heard. It, and it, and it may be the death of the project, Eve, to your point. I mean, if we can't accommodate their wishes in these plans, then we, we move to other opportunities for that, look for that 500 seat facility. Well, and then I would just hope too that if they're going to have that much input, then they also could help provide funding. The plan all along is that they w would help with that, definitely, that they would be part of the fundraising and involved with that. Great, thank you. Yeah, no, I appreciate the questions. I had just a small question from when I was looking at it. Plans A and C say that they, one of the benefits is universal restrooms. Does that mean that that would not be something that they're considering for plan B? That's interesting. I don't think that that's the case. I think that they are, 
I think that universal restrooms are in all of the plans. They just didn't call it out in B, but okay. I think that, that universal restrooms are in all of the plans. Yeah. That's really good, lady. <laughs> <laughs> you looked at these. Go ahead, Tom. Oh, we can't hear you. You're muted. You're muted. Tom, can you unmute? Yeah, I'm right. trying. I couldn't get it. It was like frozen or something. Uh, when I went in to engage Longmont the other night to look for, at the schematics, I don't know what I was doing wrong, but I couldn't find them. Did no, you say they, they're not there yet? They're not there yet. We, okay. um, yeah. We, I feel better. <laughs> nope. For my, you my you are not. <laughs> you are not missing anything. We've just had some editing that we've been working on. And um, so I think it's going to cross your fingers. I think it's going to la launch on Engage Longmont by the end of the week. So we just. Yeah, we've just I, I was thinking that's what you said earlier yeah. in your report, but I just wanted to make sure I wasn't totally inept trying to get in. No, there. I'm happy to uh, let you guys know at once it's launched on Engage Longmont so that you can Great. get in and spend some time with it. That was sure. one of the things we learned, I think, with the event that we had on the 8th, the, the free day on the 8th, is it actually does take some time to absorb this. And so I do think that Engage Longmont is a great format because you could just spend some time with it, you know, and sure. then you can give give your responses. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah. I think one of my problems, when I was looking at them, uh, the, the drawings that are in the uh, atrium right now, my big thing, some of it was trying to, to really visualize what the existing layout was, you know, because I was looking at the other and I'm like, okay, but where is what we currently have. Um, I found that a little bit difficult to see. It is a little bit difficult, but I'll share my screen again and to point it out that essentially it is the beige. Some of these colors are pretty similar to each other, um, but the bits that are drawn in this sort of gray beige represent the current building in, in all of these different renderings. <laughs> That's very helpful because I don't I didn't see anywhere on the drawings where it actually called that out. And maybe I, I missed it. I noticed that. Um, and so when uh, I had them put it up on Engage Longmont, there's a little key there. So it I hopefully on Engage Longmont it's easier to mm -hmm. notice. Great. Thanks. Any other questions about that? I, I look forward to seeing some of your feedback and hope that you share it with friends so that we can get their feedback as well. Thank you guys. Great, thanks, it's exciting. So um, are there any other board comments? Anybody have anything that they want to bring up or comment on? No, everybody wants to go to dinner. <laughs> okay. Is there a motion to adjourn the meeting? Eve, do we need to talk oh. about the board, the uh, officers' positions now? If you'd like to, that's fine. Uh, Sorry, I forgot um, about that. That's okay. That's okay. Um, it's Go not ahead. really. It's not really my role. Do you want to? Oh well, um, I guess the as you may have noticed, my um, term is up my final term is up um, at the end of June. So uh, we'll need to um, elect, or you will need to elect, I will be gone. Um, you will need to elect a new chairman and vice chair. So, um, you know, at this point, I mean, we have several people who've responded with interest. If anybody is interested, you could give Kim a call. Um, like I said, that's not coming up and that'll be the July meeting. Um, Bryden has, has been great in being the vice chair. And uh, so there will be both of those positions um, for, the, for the new term that's coming up. So anyway, just give a thought 
um, to whether or not you'd be interested in doing that. It's not a super hard job and any of you probably would do better than I've done. Oh, but, oh. Um, I have a question. Sure. Is there any reason that we could not hold the election in June for terms to begin in July so that we don't come to the July meeting without a leader? Um, I don't really know the answer to that question. I'm not sure. Joanne, are you still there somewhere? Do you know? I haven't. don't remember seeing anything specific to that. I suppose if you're electing people whose terms continue, I don't know why we couldn't do that. Let's let me have Joanne check if she doesn't. Now, I think typically what we've done is that we've just moved it to the top of the agenda in July. Oh, okay. Um, I think different boards may do it differently, but we can certainly do what you suggested, Dale. I don't see why not. Um, but typically well, we have that, waited until July. I suppose that doesn't take into consideration who is either new to the board or being renamed to the board because you wouldn't know by then, I suppose. So I just happen to think I, I belong to some groups that do it that way. Go ahead and have the election for a term to begin later, but and it seems fair to the person who's coming in as chair that they, they would know ahead of time so that they weren't, you know, all of a sudden, okay, you're the chair and you just found out five seconds ago. So whatever, I don't, it doesn't matter to me. So um, do we'll, you guys check in, we'll check into that and we'll just make sometimes appointments are delayed or not made also. So let us check into that and get back with you. Great, great comment, Dale. Okay, anybody else? Oh, sorry, is that all you, is that enough, Kim? Do we need to, is there anything else specifically you wanted to address? Okay. All right, so now, would anyone like to move to adjourn the meeting? I so move. Thank you, Dale, is there a second? I'll second, this is Rhea. Thank you, Rhea. All in favor, please raise your hands. Um, thank you. Opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. Thank you all very much and enjoy the nice weather. And we'll see you guys next month. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Thank you, Bye. everyone. Take care.